Freaking dude, like, oh my god, that feeling of just absolute, like, how do you, how do you just, I, I don't know even, I don't even know how to describe the, uh, Tricking is a form of expression. It's a sport, but at the same time, it's an art form. Um, the closest thing I can put it next to is b-boy, because it's a free form of, for people to express themselves, yet there is application, there is technique, there is foundation. It's free judging, you know? It's one of those things where you can do a 540 kick a totally different way from somebody else. You can do a gainer from totally different from somebody else. And that's what makes tricking what it is. It's a combination of movement styles from gymnastics, martial arts, and breakdance. But that's like so bland now. I feel like that's not even, it, it, there's so much more to it. A lot of the movement can come from that, but they're inspired through something totally different. Yeah, it's from martial arts, but it came from this movie or it came from this cartoon, this idea. You know, like the hurricane kick. It came from Street Fighter. Like that's a video game inspiring a move, you know? So, with stuff like that. And I made a promise to myself that if I ever learned how to, like, before I knew it was a gainer, I told myself, if I ever figure out how to do that, I will do it as much as I can, every chance I get, because that's all I want to do, and if that's the only thing that I can do, then I'll be happy. I don't think tricking unlocks something. I think it's more that people who are open like that are more drawn to tricking. I think that whether or not they did tricking, they would probably find some way to express themselves artistically. They would probably do something somewhat athletic. I don't think it's that tricking changes their brains so much as their brains are primed for tricking. Tricking 100% is a sport, you know, and there's no way to deny that. Oh, look, Finland. Yo, we used to make fun of Finnish people. <laughs> I mean, there were always. We used to, and we still make fun of the Americans. Well, yeah, what else are you going to do with Americans? <laughs> <laughs> make fun of them. Hey, guys, my Finnish buddies. <laughs> Goodbye. How are you? How are you? What's your favorite trick? Go double leg out. Go double leg out. Hyper hook! <laughs> Axe aerial. Hyper hook. Hyper swipe. 
My original inspiration came from all of the voice dubbed kung fu movies that I used to see on TV. It was it wasn't Bruce Lee actually. It was Jackie Chan, Jet Li, Yun Bu, and all the Hong Kong guys. As early as I could remember, my dad and I used to watch these voice dub films on on Sunday. They had Samurai Sunday in Chicago. And it was like all day kung fu movies, and we'd eat our ramen noodles for lunch, and and it was just flipping, kicking, wire work, flying through the air, doing 20 kicks, 20 moves, and then landing. That was my original inspiration. You know, along with that came you know the education about the Shaolin monks and what they did, and you know acrobatics and the, the feats that they would do physically, uh, mentally, manipulating their chi and their energy not just the, the physical flipping and the high flying kicks. It was always fascinating to me. So it started as early as I can remember and then it just turned into you know tournament competition, going to events and back in the early days of course you know the father of American style forms, or musical forms, Grandmaster June Rhee, and then came you know Charlie Lee, uh, John Chung and, and George Chung. And really it was George Chung that I remember he was the guy, the silver bullet guy, running, flying, sidekick, aerial, front flip. And although he wasn't doing tricking combos, that was the first anyone had really seen martial art competitors on the tournament circuit do acrobatic moves. From there it was then Jean Frenette and Keith Herbayashi, now Keith Cook. That, that were competing and doing all of these acrobatic moves in their forms, and that was that was the early to mid 80s. And from there, of course, Ernie Reyes Sr., Quan Jin M, and, and his son, you know, burst onto the scene, and then there was the West Coast Action Team. That was really the explosion in my mind when people say, where did this evolve from, you know? It was nothing new in terms of the concept. Martial arts, acrobatics, physically pushing your limits to the highest level, to outdo yourself and to see how far you could you could take it mind over matter. With West Coast Taekwondo, uh, they just they just exploded it with their demo team. Um, they were really the ones that, that took it to the next level. And then you had uh, people like yourself and and the rest of the Loop Kicks team, Kim Do, Jeremy Marinas, uh, Anish Sherfa coming over from from France. I mean, there's so you know there's so many talented uh, martial arts tr based trickers that came out of West Coast with all of their schools that made it that made it popular. I mean, that's what we remember, all of our competitors uh, from the tournament circuit, John Valera, Carmichael Simon, uh, we remember, uh, you know, the Kim Do's, you know, Ernie Reyes, then Kim Do, and then David L Douglas coming onto the tournament scene. And there were many others, but that was really the start uh, of the evolution um, in terms of kickstarting the, the actual tricking movement. Prior to that, you know, no one knew what to call it. There, there was no name for it, it was, it was just done. And then it became about, you know, oh, this is cool, let's throw some tricks. You know, that's where I believe the evolution and, and really the revolution of what happened with tricking started. And there's a lot of passion in tricking. There's a lot of passion. If you're looking not at the culture of tricking, if you're looking at tricking itself, the growth, and you're looking at tricking as a whole, as a form, you can, it's, it's obviously an art. It's obviously an art. Always spit in the face of structure. And that's what's that's what's really beautiful to me about tricking and understanding, looking at tricking and the way you trick. It's certainly not a means to an end. It's an end in itself. And you get to check all your motives, to figure out why you're tricking, but why you're tricking the way you are. You know, why do I enjoy kicking? Why do I enjoy throwing a cork? You know, what about it? You get to check your motives, and you also get to look back at your history. It's really helped open my mind. It's amazing. It's really been amazing for me. I, I mean, I've been trying to throw tricks for a long time. I really didn't become a tricker till I came out here. When I came out to California, I knew Loop Kicks was here and I always hoped to train with them. It's been amazing, an amazing transformation. Tricking has done everything that martial arts couldn't do for me. Everything that a traditional martial arts training, at least what you would see today here in America, um, it's, it's the total opposite. It's, there's no industry. We have this 
beautiful thing called the internet. It's what this is born out of. And it's been a great, massive collaboration, totally decentralized. You have someone stick out, then someone else, then someone else. It's really beautiful, the lack of a consistent source of things. Like, the last time we had that was Billy. He had an image of tricking and, he, and what he wanted, what he liked about tricking. I really respect Billy's view on tricking. Yeah. The kind of videos that Billy featured and the kind of events that he went to, he totally shaped tricking. He totally did. He really created tricking. He created tricking. I remember this was all at once, like bang, 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 2008 or 2009. All those big centers of power, or at least like the way I would look at it in tricking, just disappeared. Loop kicks. We were still around and things weren't the same. You had that. Tricks tutorials, gone and you had Bilang gone. This was a rebirth. land a trick or there's somebody else lands a trick everybody lands that trick that's there you know what I'm saying like when Scott Skelton landed his triple his the first triple cork everybody in that gym landed it with him and everybody that watched the video after that landed it with him you know what I'm saying like Everybody is one, you know, and uh, at least with tricking, I feel like it comes out the most because it really does feel like when you see your friend land a trick, you feel, you feel like you've landed it too because you've been there, you were, you were there. I feel like as soon as you make that physical connection, and especially with tricking, because like when you have that excitement, you hug that person, you, you high five them. Everybody gives you that high five. It's, it's that physical connection. It starts with like just that brief high five. And from that brief high five, all of a sudden you're hugging the person. You you can't let go of them. You, you want to pick them up, hold them above your shoulders. When you land a trick, your friends land a trick. Tricking has this flow, this uh... It's not okay to mess up. Tricking expects you to mess up. It wants you to mess up. It wants you to fall on your face, get back up, try again, and if all of a sudden, hey, you keep falling on your face, do a front sweep out of that face plant and combo back to something that you understand how to get out of and finish with something huge. I've fallen on my face and I can still like, it sucks, but like when you have that hype and that like that excitement, that energy, every time I get to the front of the line, I have no idea what I'm gonna do. Like I always have a combo set, right? Especially for the person right in front of you, you cannot help like but watch what they're gonna do. I wanna watch it and I already know that before I watch that combo, I'm gonna forget everything that I just thought. And I just wanted to like express my joy for the fact that they landed it. Like I would see him land that and I could see his joy in it and I could feel that, right? All that time, that effort, that energy that he's put into it, that fear of overcoming that, of pushing yourself on it. And you have to have that ability to sometimes step away from the crowd and work personally on your own, like whether it's off to the side on the gym or all by yourself in the grass with nobody there, no music, just 
I'm gonna work on this trick. I can't name how many tricks like that I accidentally figured out just playing by myself in the grass. Isaiah usually sleeps on the floor, but sometimes overnight. Oh, I see. And then, uh, Everywhere I look. I see residue evidence of what? <laughs> Tricking. You can feel it in the air. It's thick. It's pregnant with anticipation. There's no place a man can go that can escape the eye of the tricker. Wow! Wow! <laughs> <laughs> My bad. But this is like for gas and stuff. He's going to change the thing. Excellent. She's your car. He uh, tooled around in it. Like We've been doing that for years in our hometown. Yeah. We don't call it Kendama. We call it balance the ball. <laughs> Every mom right now would throw up. This is not a bedroom. This is like a... Um, this is like a vestibule. <laughs> and this is all your stuff right here? Yeah, on this side. Okay. Okay. And Luke, this is what you brought. My clothes are in drawers, and then I have a bag. Wow. Wow. Tricking is an art form because when you go out there, there's nothing. You have nothing to work with besides your body. The floor is your canvas, whether you have cement, plyo, sand, grass, whatever you're tricking on, that's your canvas. Tricking, first of all, is an amazing art form. It's an amazing expression of creativity, the human, the human body, and what, what it can do. I think trickers are the greatest athletes the world has never seen. Your body is your brush, and your tricks are your paint. You know, you just make a beautiful picture every time you throw a combo or you throw a single trick. You can watch 20 people do the same trick, and it's always going to be different because they put their own spin on the trick. You know, they put their style into it. They're putting their soul out there when they trick. It's not just I'm doing a hook kick. It's I'm showing you my hook kick. The, the people that's involved into it, the cultures that are involved, no more global segregation of anything. I mean, I think that's where you take the body movement and you're like, you know, why not allow people to hit the highest levels that they can achieve? And that's, that's the mastery of trickery. You're gonna trick? No, I'm not trick. Really? I definitely think that dreams are important. I have a lot of dreams that regard to tricking. It's like all of my life, so I think it helps me with my tricks as well. Dreams are, you know, you go, you go throughout your day and you're thinking things and you have all these thoughts, all these emotions and feelings. When you go to sleep, I think that they kind of go with you. So when you're dreaming, uh, you're kind of learning. You're not awake, like actively doing things. But in your dreams, you still have emotion, you still have feeling. Uh, you could see how you would have felt about something almost if something happens. So you could definitely like learn from them. Uh, when I do tricks in dreams, I feel them, you know? I definitely think that by feeling that, by, uh, by knowing it in my head, it helps me like when I wake up and I'm back here. So a lot of people say like tricking is like flying. Um, I really like uh, The Last Airbender. And I kind of think of tricking like in that universe. So I watch uh, like surfing documentaries, and I think surfing is the most perfect comparison to tricking because in surfing, it's you working with waves, you're working with water. There's never a clash. You know, sometimes the water will take you down, sometimes you will work well with the water but you're always working with it, you're never fighting against it. With tricking, I feel like it's, you know, you're working with the earth. You're, whenever you throw a kick, you're not, just, you're not just jumping, you're taking the energy from the earth, you're pushing it through your body and you're letting the earth push you into the air for a limited amount of time. You're just taking that small, small flight. So like, I think of trickers as earthbenders where they're just getting tossed into the air and they're making the most of their time in the air. Some people could see it as airbending. Yeah, I just think of it as getting a brief glimpse of leaving Earth for a small amount of time.
Chicken is so beautiful because it brings everybody together. It creates this awesome sense of community and it gives people purpose to wake up every day. That's the biggest reason why I trick. It's definitely a sense of purpose. That feeling is so amazing to be, just be aware of your body and what it can do and how actually limitless it really is, you know? It's constantly progressing forward and, and I don't think it's gonna stop anytime soon. This is kind of like how I view all tricking and how I view the sport as, as a whole. Um, it's not, I don't see tricking as like something that I do. Um, I see tricking as an emotional response to my everyday life, to my to how I am, to the influences in my life. Over the course of the, the weekend, you've had things that have caused emotional responses. And your emotions uh, drive everything that you do, whether you're a sociopath or not. Your emotions drive everything that you do. And when I trick, I trick solely based on emotion. Visualizing it is not so much visualizing, I feel it. I don't visualize it. Well, I mean, like, I walk myself through the trick, but I feel myself doing it. You know, I was so hyped up from the battles, I was so excited. I mean, like, I wanted to go out and trick. Everything in my life um, is geared around it. Like, I see it as an emotional response. Everything that I do, everything is based on this charged energy that I channel into tricking. I have no other outlet. Like, lifting weights doesn't do it to me. You know, but tricking is a release. And I literally feel um, myself, you know, releasing the energy yeah. when, I, when I trick. And it's... Every trick is based on that. If it's aggressive, I mean, I could be, I could be angry, I could be very happy, I don't know. But, you know, I've had a few people tell me that they, they see how I feel when I trick. Um, they can tell, people that train with me can tell, you know, how I feel when I trick. And it's, that's what it is to me. Not, not so much visualizing that I feel the tricks. That's why when I, when I watch somebody trick, I can, like, I feel what they're feeling. Like, it's, it's this kind of connection that I have with another tricker that makes it to where I can't connect with normal people um, because I can't connect with them that way. They don't have the same, they don't share the same emotional response that I do. And so like watching like him do a full and then flail in the air like four or five times and then retwist and land and jump around in the air, like I, I get that. You know, like I, I relate to it. Whereas like somebody walking down the street gets pissed about, you know, there being like oh, too long of a line. I don't get that. I don't, you know? And so, Having that connection with trickers is what that's all about for me. Like before I go into a trick, I'm like, what am I? What am I showing about myself? What kind of person am I? Am I portraying myself as? You know, how am I connecting with the people around me? How am I building that bond? How am I? We have connection that we'll never have with anyone else. Is there
visualization before the trick, it dictates your legacy because that video goes down, right? Yeah. And so you think about what you're going to do and then you do it and everybody around you gets an emotional response. So they, they react in kind with their tricking and then you get the, the response and you feed off of each other. And that's, that's the value of that, that visualization, like seeing it is because you, you're going to be connecting with someone on a different level that you're not going to connect with anybody else in the world on. It's very important. It's like rushing someone afterwards. It's a powerful thing. Um, and that happens inside of each trigger, which is pretty amazing. Tricking to me is the best way that I can express myself. I didn't really know a way to do it, um, any other way to do it until I found tricks. And then I, like, I always wanted to find tricking and then I found it. And the reason why I've stuck with it so long is because one, it's what I've been looking for my whole life. And two, it is literally the only way that I can express um, everything. You know, I started probably very similar to a lot of people in martial arts. You know, when you're four or five years old, you know, you get to watch martial arts on film or Sunday morning, Saturday morning, you know, cartoons or kung fu shows. But, you know, for me, I was, I was small. I was young, I was bullied. And um, it was an avenue for me just to learn something about you know, self-defense. It wasn't about, you know, a little bit about self-confidence and, and self-discipline, but it evolved, you know, during my time as a martial artist. I started at the age of five and I uh, received my first black belt at nine years old. I was living in a small town, Annapolis, Maryland, which is the outskirts suburbs of Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. But at the time, I didn't know that there was uh, a huge influence of sport martial artists who are under Grandmaster June Ray. Um, I did, you know, tournament circuits, you know, regionally and uh, in the Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area. I'm around nine years old, 10, 11, and I stopped. You know, competition for me wasn't uh, something that really inspired me. You know, I looked at it as, you know, why am I being judged? There's no reason to judge me. Yes, I have skill, but there's a lot of other people out there who have skill as well. Um, so I left martial arts for about a year, skateboarded, tried to do a little bit of BMX, and it's just one of those things that I started to learn about conditioning of myself as a person. And I made a decision around 12 years old was to go back into the competition circuit to really see where I was overall evolved as a martial artist because I learned both styles, hard style and soft style. And I knew that there was a stage that I could utilize in a platform. And at the time, you know, it was Professional Karate League and then it was North American Sport Karate Association that allowed me to, you know, be able to highlight American freestyle martial arts. It was just taking the essence of Eastern philosophy and martial arts and combining that with the Western marketing and flair and what we do here in the States, American freestyle. Take it to that level and um, innovate and, and be able to compete on a, on a wonderful platform that's allowed me to do entertainment, um, stunts, work with great artists, and um, be able to evolve myself and dance. And at that time, after I'd done, you know, finished my competition and all of my you know, accolades in the entertainment business, I had the opportunity to move out to San Jose. And that's where my opportunity, not just me as a professional with an education per se, but I always looked up to Ernie Reyes Jr. It wasn't Bruce Lee, um, it was Ernie Jr. And maybe because he was tangible to me, I could actually have a discussion with him. It was somebody that was pretty close to my age that I could relate to, as well as I knew when, I knew in time, as she grew, I would be able to grow. And with that, I think that's where a lot of us within the, the tricking community at, at large allow ourselves to just collaborate because we are tangible people who we can have conversations with. Yes, we have the artistic expression of it, and yes, we understand the fundamental skills and how to break things down. And yes, we can educate and teach each other, but that also comes with conversations. And I think that's where the influence of what Ernie Jr. as American martial artist has done, as well as the associations of West Coast, as well as Junery, was really being able to be the forefathers of the last, you know, four decades, you know, 60s and 70s, all the way, you know, from martial arts 
ballet to musical forms to creative forms to you know being able to break that away and subset tricking and be able to expand that as a whole new genre to to dance you know to be able to combine that and now we have groove and then now we have athletes that are able to be positioned in sport martial arts within hyper or we have you know people within the entertainment business who can get jobs with the resume of XMA. So I think it all collectively works together. What is the history of it? It's his story. And the, the, the thing is, let's find the roots. Let's understand where the, the, all this has come from. I think that's where, for us collectively, once we know who the forefathers are, you know, realize that we can take it to the next level as a, as a, as a community. Tricking, if we're just talking about tricking itself, it's, it starts with the internet because you're not gonna see it anywhere else. You're not gonna have it presented to you as tricking anywhere else. Let's talk about the beginning. Right from the beginning, it's bylang.com. Absolutely, that defined tricking for me. Anything else I probably found off of his uh, links page had links to FS website, bootkicks, sportmartialarts.com is where I got a lot of stuff. Um, there wasn't uh, embedded flash. So you could just download the videos and they were just always on your computer forever. When I was on Bilang the first couple times, I would look at the clip section, not the sampler section. I don't know, maybe I saw a bad sampler and, or maybe it took too long to download at the time, right? So I was into short clips. Juji is like the yin to Billy Bilang's yang. They were like, hey, this is actually this much of a rotation or hey, this move is like this move. And it was beautiful, it was like, just watching, watching this thing grow. All the massive leaps and bounds was through the internet, through posting the videos, you know, having these pre-YouTube sites. Club 540, Sean Cannon basically invented YouTube. I never got to meet him, but I got a lot of respect for that guy, you know. He made tricking what it is right now. Uh, Juji, Billy, Loop Kicks. Um, the Loop Kicks website, I would check all the time, even though it never got updated. Always watching the loop kick samplers. The internet itself is that's it. It needed it needed to be here for tricking to come. You needed the internet. You absolutely needed the internet. I think I think sport karate might have been able to get to that point. It would have it would have taken a lot longer. It would have taken a lot longer. The same debate that's going on about you know net neutrality, like it's happening worldwide and it crosses over to everything. Like I see it in everything now. It's, there's a beautiful illustration of this in tricking. It's the decentralized nature. People getting to the bottom of the things better without a leader. People are waking up to all sorts of different things and shedding old beliefs, unlearning all this terrible conditioning brought on by whatever. Whatever kind of conditioning that you receive that's not even necessarily good or bad, but just closing you off from all these different things that you could be experiencing or understanding, applying to your life. Tricking is that, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't have had this in the martial arts community. There's too much structure, there's too much, you know. Bruce Lee invented tricking, whatever works for you. Jeet Kune Do, we're fighting without fighting. Bruce, you like Krishnamurti, man. Krishnamurti, Krishnamurti said it best. The culture of tricking should be no culture. And that's basically what we got. We have a lot of different people from a lot of different walks of life. What I would hope that we can agree on is keeping discourse open, but just understanding and, you know, being conscious about it. Like when you're learning to read again, it's, it's, it's awesome. When you learn how to ride your bike, you know, the first time, it's, it's a whole new world. The first trick I've ever learned was actually a, a butterfly twist. I was kind of used to the movement just because of Rudy's, but the basic skills in tricking, like they, they've been way harder to me than that, um, like a scoop, like I couldn't get a scoop forever. How'd it feel to like land that one combo that you know you tried so many times and then you finally got it, you finally got it. Super Saiyan, that's what I feel like. I was like, yo, I like I, in any tumbling move, I've never been excited, you know, but after I landed, I don't know what combo it was, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> one of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, do like and it's, it's it's crazy how like it brings out a different side of you. You know, it's unpredictable. Mm -hmm. It brings out a side that you didn't know you had. Galleries began when loop kicks began, or when the West Coast demo team or action teams came about. Was they were able to create the 
the synergy and the sequencing and the choreography and the staging properly that the audience could relate to is not just one person can do this, an entire squad can do this, entire crews can do this, and people can really educate themselves. And I believe that's where the Trigon community, you know, took it and ran with it and developed their own ways of repositioning, mixing, mastering their techniques, and be able to run the variations and combinations. It's the, the blueprint of, um, you know, sport and martial arts, and then when you go into film, you use the same level, level of techniques, and then you go into the, you know, the, the culture of tricking and, and being able to utilize those combinations, the variations, and taking it to the next level, and really work the condition and apply metrics, which you guys have already have developed through you know, the Loop Kicks gathering. You know, I think that is the platform. It's not the stage of a martial arts tournament. Gatherings that occur in the tricking community that allow other people to really feel comfortable. They don't have to feel a level of anxiety. They don't have to feel like they're being judged, but they can work their variations, their combinations, they can master their mixes, and their, you know, and, and really articulate the style of tricking. And that's where I believe that tricking in the next even five years is gonna take a life of its own. It will end up becoming just like skateboarding has become a street sport. It would it started at, in the pools or half pipe or long boards, and now you see, you know, you see the skateboarders, you know, doing a lot more street tricking, you know, quote unquote parkouring and tricking. And you know, I think you'll have those type of individuals who are able to cross fuse from different genres. So it's not just doing the martial arts anymore, doing hard soft, soft style. It's doing the trick and the parkour and the skateboarding and, and half piping and off of a high dive and seeing how many high dive flips you can do before you even hit the pole. I think that's where tricking has become its own level of intricacy. As simple as spinning a plate or spinning, you know, pencils. I think it's all mastery of, and it's not even an illusion. I mean, the, the word tricks it seems as though it's a mastery of, a, of some level of an illusion. The interesting thing about it, it's not even an illusion, it's, it's real. And tricking is real. Dude, I'm so sweaty, man. I mean, I was like, you get, like I was like doing kicks because I love them, so and I do them. It teaches you to pick yourself back up when nobody's around. It teaches you to be a better person, you know. Of course, that's going to be a part of, you know, tricking. Um, it's, a, it's a part of life, you know, I mean. That's all I like about tricking. They teach you a lot of life lessons as well. Oh, the first trick I had was a butterfly to it. Patience. <laughs> Patience. Um, coming from Tomlin, you know, everything was always kind of, it was hard, but it wasn't as hard. But with tricking, you know, it's a whole new world. Belief, faith, you know. Like, you're off axis, you know. Like, it's, if you don't believe that you can do this, then you won't be able to do it to your ability. Faith is probably the most important that I've attained. Don't yell at me. Second, if you do a trick, I'll do a trick. You gotta do it first. We'll try it. Cartwheel! Go we'll do a trick. Go we'll do a cartwheel. Go we'll do something. Tricking for like years a week. How long have you been tricking? Like almost like two weeks. We have to do it every day. Yeah. Every day for my whole entire life. Yeah, you'd be so good. Every tricker always has that little extra of them that you would have never known. Like John Bennett and he's jump roping champion, yeah? Yeah. I'm like what? <laughs> jump rope? That's amazing. I would never think that. He was Mr. Jump Rope, yo. That's incredible. Everybody has just their other talent, their other passion, their other hobby that they did. It's 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 crazy. Why do you love it? Why do you love the community? Why do you love coming out to Cali? Why do you love the gatherings? Why do you love it? Acceptance. Like no matter where you come from, no matter who the people are, you know, like there's no egos. People they 
they just they love you because you're doing something that you love and you may be laying on your head every day but it's the heart that matters you know so i would probably say acceptance that's exactly why i love it and then you know that goes along with love you know you can't accept somebody if you don't love them but the tricking community is so accepting if you don't do tricking then i think you should tricking tricking helped bring me out of that uh like, because I saw people who were all sizes doing crazy things. But I talked to people in tricking. They were like, you know what, if you just, if you work at it, if you honestly work at it, and it's something that you truly want, you can have it. It was something one of my karate instructors said too. I was training for something, and he told me, he was like, you feel that hunger? I was like, yeah, he's like, always feel that hunger. Like, always. No matter, no matter what it is, no matter what part of your life that it applies to, you want to feel that, that want to be better than you were the day before. I would say the first thing that I noticed that I love, I feel like I almost crave more than anything, is that feel of the grass and like the dirt beneath the grass, beneath my feet, you know, my not socks, not shoes, not sandals, like my bare feet just in a grassy field Oh, you're on your way there. You're walking there. And you're something inside you, you get excited because you know you're going to take your shoes off and you can't wait to get your, like, at least for me, I can't wait to get my shoes off. Anytime I trick, like, I, whatever it is, I, I automatically feel better. Sometimes good grass is hard to find. You don't always do stuff right away, but when you find that good grass, you're like, okay, cool, cool. Then you start, you start to trick and uh, you start to fall. You start to land, you start to get into this groove. Whether you're alone or you're with your friends, whether you have music, whether it's quiet, whatever time of day it is, you have this feeling where you're connected. At least with tricking, I feel like it, it's taught me to open my mind to more possibilities. Taking off barefoot on nothing but the earth and then landing. We can take off. We've built, we've built things that shoot off of the ground and go off into that and break this, this atmosphere. I feel like with tricking, it is trying to get as close to that as you can with nothing but your body. It's just the earth and it's just you. Whether it's you by yourself or it's you and a hundred of your friends and you're tricking. Whether you realize it or not, it's like you're putting yourself in the air and seeing how many twists, flips, and kicks you can do. Whether you can land on one foot, your hyper foot, both feet, pop out of it, wrap out of that, carry through out of that, into the next aerial maneuver that you can. We're only using the ground, I feel like. Tricking, I feel like, is trying to fly. As humans, as people, as everything here, we evolved, more or less, we, we grew from something more basic and became more advanced. I would definitely say that tricking is kind of like a, like a virus. It's contagious. Even people who have never seen tricking before, they're amazed. They're like a moth to the flame. They're just, they stare at it and they, they can't help but to ask questions. That's why I think that it exploded so much and it's so huge. It's a world-renowned sport. There's people from all over here in Loop Kicks camp, Finland and Korea and the US and Australia and people from all over the world come together. Just There's constantly this, uh, this sense of try harder or kick harder or just really go out there and do it and do your best. And however that ends up being is, is okay because you're putting your heart and soul into it and everybody's always cheering you on because of that. So 
That's why it's such an amazing sport. This was the original lower level, and where we were just at was all flat deck up there. And so, anyway, the doctor got busted, the house was seized, and then my in-laws bought it. Build a house on top of it. So he built that house up there on top of it. So that's how this place came to be. I just go from there, right from there. Sorry to explain. Really, uh, kind of like, kind of like meditation, I would say. Really blank, really blank, and a lot of energy. I just let go of anything that I've been thinking. Usually like close my eyes, breathe, helps me with tricking. I just do it as I'm tricking almost. Tricking is like uh, an experience that meditation takes place within almost. The whole time that I'm tricking and that I'm in a group or like at a gathering or something, I'm completely embodied by that experience. And it's really, it's a really deep experience. It's, it is like, it's like a really deep level of meditation almost. I'm really into like the the gathering and just like everything that's happening, like the tricks, the circles, you know. So a lot of times I'll just be like rushing, rushing, trying to get back like out onto the floor to trick, maintain like a level head to keep myself like at that place though, meditating for sure. It's interesting to me now that you can actually go into a gymnastics gym and they'll say, oh, you do tricking. Because I remember years ago, you would have been like, oh, I'm doing things. And they're like, what is that called? Oh, tricking. OK, cool. Fair enough, guy. But now it's sort of universally recognized. I think the proliferation of videos and tutorials and so on on the internet, it helps. I look at myself as kind of a dinosaur in the tricking community. I can't do triple corks. I wow. I don't, there's a pterodactyl in here. I can't do a lot of the newer moves, and I recognize that. And then I see little seven-year-olds like Dallas Lou over a jam just owning hard in ways that I could never even imagine it. Time? I don't really know, you know? I'm, I mean, I don't think anybody really knows for sure what's going on with the time. For me, I know that I'm living right now. I know that I'm talking to you. I know that we're both here. So this moment, this experience, this is time for me. This is time and it's always been here, right, right now. Living the now, definitely, that's what I believe in. Right now, when I'm not tricking, uh, I feel pretty scattered. I feel like I, I still feel like I have energy, you know, but I feel like I'm not really using it. I feel like I, I use a lot more energy. I'm uh, more in tune with it, I think, because uh, I'm using more of it, you know.
I don't know, I've thought about that a few different times and uh, I always find myself coming around to a different answer, but it really, it really tested my connection to tricking when, when I did take a break. I don't know, I guess it was just sort of combined with growing up, going through life's obstacles, the family problems and stress and becoming an adult, growing from child to adult, taking on more responsibilities and I guess the reason why I trick or even the reason why I found it again is because there's so much passion that goes into something like tricking and the art form. I almost don't want to say it's an escape from reality but that's kind of what it feels like it, when there's whatever problem that you ran into for the day or some drama that happened or some you know obstacle that life puts in your way for whatever reason because the universe works in mysterious ways. I still have my passion and I still have what I do to kind of center me again and bring me back to the present and make me aware of who I am and where I am and why I'm on, on the planet, you know. What's amazing about the history of tricking is, you know, the pathways to tricking are uh, many. There are a lot of different paths look at some of the earliest trickers and where they drew from, you find all these different places, but at the same time, the trickers you drew from, you know, someone else might not even know, and they may have a really wonderful, extensive knowledge of tricking. And a lot of it's getting mainstreamed now, but there's still people that, you know, I didn't know about at all. I especially get really sucked into certain styles. You know, I'll watch a single sampler or a single, you know, set of raw footage over and over and over and over again. Like, you know, that's what happened with Steve Tarada, Alex Hunter's NYG footage, stuff like that. I'll just get stuck on it. You know, Sesh, I, I feel like Sesh would probably give you the best answer, tricking history. But from my understanding, the way that I look at it, it's, it's a lot of perspective. For me, I saw tricking come up on the East Coast through the tournament circuit, but I was still out of the loop, you know, I wasn't doing anything close to tricking while Jaime was tricking, while Crazy Asian was getting into it, all of them, you know, I got to see them when they you know, were first starting to become seasoned, well-known trickers, like, it was really, really a trip to, to work with them, uh, to learn tricking from them, you know, I really learned everything from those guys. First session ever, me, Jamal, and Daniel Sterling at Hot Shots. That's it, That's all the, we were the only people who showed up. Me, Jamal, and Daniel Sterling. Wow, how did that person just do a 720? It's like normal. Oh yeah, 540, 720, 1080, beat twist, cork, double cork, right? What used to be the ceiling where nobody ever thought. People would joke and say, oh, it'd be cool if you could like jump in the air and spin two times in a, in, in a row and then throw a kick. Like that was fantasy back then uh, when I was competing. But that, those are basics now, 547, 20, backside, nine. Those are basics. I think part of it was physically people didn't know what to do. We needed a better way to teach it. And as it evolved, those who were doing it found better ways, more efficient ways to train it and teach it. Two, the mindset. Um, the attitude people had and the approach, it wasn't, it wasn't unfathomable anymore. It wasn't out of reach. It was, it was uh, within reach. And then as the trick started getting more difficult, because there was a very long period where it was 540, it was 720. And then Mark Canizato, the first to land in competition in our XMA Tricks battle uh, for the US Open on ESPN, he was the first to land a 1080. Standing, not even the running, just 
standing 1080. And when he did that, everyone was like, oh my God. After that, you know, then like the, the likes of Steve Tarada and of course Kim Doe and, you know, in our tricking battles, um, that's where the combos really started to happen. And, and that took it to, to a totally different level where people, you know, thought that a 540 hook kick aerial was the biggest thing since sliced bread um, that became the norm. You know, even even before that, even before our tricking battles on ESPN, Carmichael Simon, uh, I, I keep saying him because he was really the innovator. I did a backflip in my form, jump split, back tuck, right? Okay, so a two move combo. Um, I did an aerial, tornado, tornado hook aerial, not even a 540 hook kick aerial. Um, but I was much more the conservative one. And, and with XMA, again, it's about life skills, leadership training, performance art. But the world of tricking is so wide and vast. Carmichael Simon, I, I, I remember it clearly. Bluegrass Nationals in Kentucky, 540 hook kick um, butterfly twist, 540 hook kick aerial, and he spun around, did a skip front kick, jump split kick, landed in this, uh, and it was like, it was over. Every, uh, all he had to do was bow at that point and say, See ya. And that was it, but he kept going, finished his form, and, and he really, amongst all of us, before David Douglas came on the scene, he was the one that really took what John Chung did, John Fernet did, to the next level. And then, yes, we all, John Valera and myself, David, uh, David Douglas, we all incorporated these things. But he was the innovator in terms of the first on the tournament circuit. Right now, we're at the winter gathering. It's gonna be crazy. It's just about to start. Everyone's warming up, killing it right now, bringing some amazing tricks. So, I just can't wait to battle. I'm excited. You're battling tonight, dude. Oh, oh, Matt Emming. It's gonna be crazy, you guys. Feeling good? Feeling real good. <laughs> Dinosaur.
before there was an internet presence for tricking, it was mainly martial artists who wanted to add flashier things to their forms. So they learned tornado kicks and then 540 kicks, cheat seven kicks and so forth. Everyone started learning a lot faster. Before that, you know, capoeira, people would do their capoeira moves. Tricksters would come up with moves that were basically the exact same things but not realize they already existed. Once everyone could get together in the same place, they started going, oh, hey, we can learn from each other. They started meeting up, they started sharing videos. There was a sort of realization that there are people out there who could move in ways that you didn't think were possible, like the Steve Toradas and the Logans back in the day, doing double twists and snapper swipes back when everyone thought double leg twists and triple corks, etc., were impossible. Everyone had a realization of where the starting ground was. With tutorials and so on, they could learn all the tricks from their own computer. They wouldn't have to go to a school, which didn't exist. YouTube didn't come along until quite a while into the online tricking scene, but before that, they could send videos back and forth on AIM or MSN. They could upload them to their own private servers and send them back and forth, and you'd spend like five hours downloading the new sampler from Latif Crowder or something and being like, oh, he's so buff, how does he do that? After uh, YouTube in particular came out, then everybody could suddenly, instantly upload their videos, instantly share their videos. You didn't have to have a uh, four million gigabyte hard drive just of samplers and random clips. And that meant that all of a sudden, random kids in Russia who had never seen anything could just go out in their backyard in the snow and do like a triple cork and make the rest of us wonder how they learned that. Ever since I could remember, I knew I was going to do that someday. I would be flying through the air and doing martial arts. And so that was the plan. I graduated from high school, moved out to San Jose, California. I was at San Jose State for a semester. But I was, I was one of the lucky competitors. Uh, worked very hard, you know, was at the top of my game. And I was cast to do a show called WMAC Masters. Second season, many of the cast members from the first season were former tournament competitors or Olympic gold medalists, and that started everything. So from there, you know, I went from Northern California, made the move down to, to Los Angeles, and then it was, okay, uh, what, what do I do? And, you know, we were all thinking after the show that, oh, well, we're on a TV show, then someone's going to call us and you know, ask us to be on another show, right? We didn't know, but that, of course, is not the reality. You, you get an agent, you start to audition, you put together a resume, and you start getting, you know, your, your, your headshot. Didn't even have a headshot or a resume put together at the time. Over a million SAG actors, Screen Actors Guild actors, over a million non-union actors, and the competition is fierce. Over 600 people, you know, move to Los Angeles every, I think it's either every week or every month to pursue the entertainment career. Dallas. Okay, Dallas is crazy. 12? Is he 12? Like Dallas is, he's at that cusp of where he's about to get really good in, in retrospect of how good you can get in tricking. Like just seeing his presence, like he's so comfortable on the floor, you know? Like I think that was, I come from sport crowding, but he's just comfortable, like he's just having fun. That's what I noticed the most about it is that it's like a kid in a candy store. When he gets to go out and trick, he's having fun. Whether he lands it or not, I mean, even if he doesn't land, he just does a hook to something or other to the splits. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's he's it. having fun, man. To like, be he's young. Having a blast. Like Kinsey, Kinsey's getting really sharp. I mean, like she, she puts a lot of guys down. Michelle. Like her kicks and um, just the way that she trains. Like you can tell that she cross trains. She definitely works out and like trains to be good at tricks. Like not just, you know, good, but good at tricks. Mm -hmm.
So I feel like the age of, of kids, like Jacob Pinto, like a lot of these kids are starting to like go through puberty and grow up into a tricking body. So their like hormones are building them into a tricker. I know I started tricking like after I'd kind of developed a lot. And so I had to work on it. Whereas they're like naturally developing their muscle tone, their body shape, everything is becoming, you know, that that's needed for a trick. You know, all of them are like 10% of what they will be in like three years. If today was a preview of what 10% of what they're gonna have is, is I'm really excited to see what they do. The athleticism required to do a lot of what we do, like you think about a lot of Olympic gymnasts and they, they have trouble wrapping their heads around what we do and the physical power to do to do a lot of what we do and you know their their bodies, like it's it's amazing that they can do it. You know, finding the the power. Probably back in like 2007, 2008, there was maybe five trickers in Colorado. A lot of us were kind of budding out of sport karate. When Nick and I looked at what was going on we said you know we really want to develop these trickers who, who are coming out of sport karate they don't know really what they're doing some of them are coming out of parkour let's go and find where they're at and train them and at the time that was in colorado springs over the course of about three years we started just recruiting and pulling people in just the nature of tricking is you know oh what is that oh check it out oh my gosh that's fun you should do it with us hey all right new friends so then we said hey you know what i think we can get a hold of a nice facility and, and start making something happen we did a trial run called colorado locals gathering 2012 we've got some videos on our youtube and it was really just a great turnout. We had a lot of locals up from all over Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, all the way through. It was a, a triggering mechanism to leap great growth in our community. And so then we just want to keep building that. We're like, yo, we, we want to do that again. Okay, who do we need out again? Well, we're starting to get more in the power moving. I see people starting to, you know, kind of get boxed in. Well, who's the best person in the world for taking you right out of your box? Seshamaru. Oh my gosh. Show you what community is around you that we forget about during the week because we're all working and we only get to a few sessions here and there. Show you some new options, let you get out of the box, and then inspire you toward the next gathering. If you love something, like, no matter what's in your car, it's like, if you love something, you follow it, I believe that, like, you know, it will, it will consume you and you will achieve whatever goals those are. And of course, you can make, you know, passion your profession. Like, just put your heart into it, all of it. Not like one-third, two-fourths, you know, like, all of it. 
for our, as a body and our brain, I think it, it, it definitely makes us look at the world different, you know? I mean, like um, a normal person, they would see grass and they would just see grass, you know? But I mean, a tricker or a tumbler or whatever, they would look at grass and they'd be like, oh, I can go out there and may have my own little playground, you know, have fun. So I think it definitely alters your perception on everything. Literally what I've learned about tricking from training with Scott is that falling or not getting the trick that you're aiming for is quite literally part of what you need to learn to get it. For example, like I, ne I definitely know for sure the first time I tried triple cork, I was nowhere near it, but the first time I tried it I was very excited. Once you get to that point of like just falling over and stuff, you start to progress into what you need to know to get like slightly higher or twist slightly faster or kick slightly harder. Because I can tell you like with 100% confidence every single one of us has fallen on many, many tricks and it's how we learn, it's how you pick yourself back up and learn from what your mistakes. That's the same with everything. Tricks, life, everything. In my opinion, learning how to fall correctly is important. I train every move till it's 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 good enough to the point of where it's the next the next step is a natural progression, not like something I have to force or something I have to crash on a million times to land. I'm so ready to do it when I do it because I've done like say I've done double full so many times that like swinging it is just natural or a double full pot flash is just natural. Learning how to fall correctly because all the different aspects are going to change like the, the crowd, the atmosphere, the floor, how tired you are, it's, it's always going to change so learning to fall correctly um, prevents injury but you also kind of learn how to adjust in the air and that's something that we can do that a lot of other acrobats can't do is they can't adjust in the air. I mean they have to have everything perfect. Nelson, Nelson is very good at at turning a fall into a work of art. He recovers in a very beautiful way. Falling is important to trick in my Hey, do a backflip! Uh, my name is Michael Rapper Gatsby II, and I am from Baser, Kansas, in America, USA. <laughs> I actually found it through martial arts. So I discovered tricking through martial arts. I was going to a martial arts camp out in Chicago, Team Sharky Karate. They were doing all these martial arts slips and stuff, and I wanted to get into it, and so I started watching things on uh, like the Discovery Channel that was like uh, extreme martial arts, this thing, XMA, and all that other stuff, and got into it through there, and went to a couple of those camps and learned a, bit, a couple of the basics, like 540s and uh, gainer and decent round off, and just kind of taught myself on from there. I started really young, I started at about 10. The people that I started with, they were already like, like uh, probably 14 maybe I think. They were all better than me really quickly and so that kind of pushed me to step up my game and try to be better than everybody else because whenever I would see them do something I got really like a competitive like feel inside and I would just be like God, I gotta be better than that and then I would try it and just fall and I couldn't, it took me a while. Eventually I uh, started catching on on how to get better than the people I trained with and then now I see other YouTube videos and try to be better than each of those videos. Watching Michael Trick, video doesn't really give that guy justice. Because no like in video you see moves, right? Where in person you just see him moving. Because you see him walk up to the trick, how he, he thinks about it beforehand, how he does it and then walks away from it and kind of like how he responds to things and it's just he's unnatural. But I don't believe that. Like no. I look at it and I'm like, after watching him in person, but seeing him trick at full capacity, it actually makes everything possible to me. Mm. Like I, yeah. I realize absolutely, I absolutely. realize how little I'm I'm using my body, how little yeah. I'm using momentum. Like I'm you, I'm, I'm like fighting gravity almost. Whereas like he is using it. Yeah, he uses it exactly. Like he. That's when, what I noticed as well. It's just ridiculous. I mean, sometimes I think that uh, some of the things that we do definitely uh, defy gravity quite a bit. I don't think that people back in the day would have ever thought anything like this would have ever have co uh, like come on just because we're basically like floating for seconds in the air. The glory of his tricking is he gains power from every transition and I've never seen a tricker that does that. Like he's found a way to continuously gain momentum and seeing that makes it possible. Not the other way around, like I, di I didn't feel defeated. Nope. You know? Like especially when battling him, I was just like, yo. Motivated. That's doable. Like mm. I feel like with enough training, that's totally doable. He understands how he does it and how he moves his body. It's the difference between doing moves and moving your body. He moves his body. 
what I like about just any kind of sport, really, I mean, it, it teaches you never to give up. Because, I mean, um, just like in life, you're going to come to an obstacle and, and tricking or football, basketball, any kind of sport, you, there's going to be some kind of obstacle that you come in, in contact with. You just got to, it teaches you never to give up on something, you know. And I think um, a lot of kids nowadays, they're so addicted to, like, this, these TV shows and they live, like, this fantasy. But when it actually comes down to actually getting out there and they come in contact with the like a wall or something they don't know how to get over it because all they know is watching TV or they don't they never ever really worked for anything so I think if they put trick in or as a like school activity yeah that'd be amazing it would it would definitely change the world that's for sure but other than that it's really just hard work not really just like a cheat code of levitation and stuff like that we all just work really, really hard to get where we want to be, and then we find that happy spot and stay there, or we keep going. You don't have to worry about the floor, the floor's always there. You don't have to pull for your landing, it's gonna happen. You know, you just have to relax in the move, you gotta be in the moment, you gotta, you know, you gotta just move your body and it, and it, and it works. Like every move is a setup. Like everything, you, you need to attack every trick like a setup and just the way he thinks about tricks is amazing. The community is amazing. Um, compared to Tumbling community, I mean, like if you're not good um, in the Tumbling community, then people they really don't give you props, so they really don't talk to you either. Really, like they'll look at you and be like, oh, what are you here for? But I mean, in tricking, yeah, I think everybody gets it that um, not everybody was as good as they are right now. So I mean, like if you come in the tricking circle and you just blink a few times, everybody's gonna give you claps as long as they can sh see that you're like giving your heart and what you're doing. So the the community in tricking and parkour as well. It's um, it's it's amazing. I love it. It's a lot of support and love. So it's definitely yeah. I love it a lot. It's amazing. I don't think of it in a way that we're kind of like breaking the boundaries of what people believe is like they're flying. It's not like that. We're actually working very well with the limitations of what people believe is possible or not. Nick Vale and Mike Guthrie. I've never seen people do anything like that at all. And it's not that they're breaking the law of physics. It's just that they are might I say, pushing the boundaries of what people believe are possible and not. And that's amazing to watch. I've never seen stuff like what I've seen while I've been in America, ever. It's unbelievable. Everyone is accepted. There's no one that really gets pushed aside. If uh, you're like some sort of emo kid, and uh, there's a prep kid, and then they both start drinking, they're somehow gonna end up friends, you know? Like, there's no, like, there's no really, uh, uh, boundaries really with tricking and different types of ways like that. I think that part's actually really important. Um, if you don't see yourself doing it, you're really not going to do it. That means you're not really, if you don't see yourself doing it, you don't have faith in yourself doing it. Like right before I go on, I, I usually stand around or sit around wherever everybody else is going and I'm thinking about what's going to come next. And so I'll, I'll usually get like a, a new idea in my head of one or two tricks. And then I like to go on the floor with one or two tricks and turn it into a five or six combo, five or six move combo, you know? Um, just with uh, visualizing wise, uh, right before I go, if I can't just like focus enough to visualize it just right before I do it, I like to just kind of like stick, take a step back and close my eyes and just really block everything out and pretend every, every, just, like, everything is just black and you're just tricking in a black space and it's just relaxing. Everything about tricking is relaxing to me. The similarities between tricking and fire dancing, the similarities are that you 
have to use your imagination. A lot of creativity comes into creating combinations of patterns. With fire dancing, it's about manipulating the fire and creating a pattern that looks really cool. It's the same for tricking, you know, you're throwing a kick or a twist or a swing through. The ultimate goal is to connect all these different movements and styles and create an, an awesome flow. That's, that's why I love it so much. It's, it's the freedom in, in movement. I sort of got burnt out, got injured a couple of times, and uh, I guess it sort of messed with my motivation a little bit. I guess you would say stunted my, my progression being injured. So I took a break from tricking, started doing other things like theater and dance. Then I discovered the flow arts or circus arts, doing fire dancing, and that's, I guess that's my favorite part about tricking is that it's such a hybrid sport. It, comes from, from every acrobatic area, I would say martial arts, gymnastics, dancing. For me specifically, I got into the, the poi dancing and the flow arts, letting my body heal from, from all the acrobatics and the tricking. And then I just sort of just rediscovered my flame, so to speak, and, and started trying to bring the two together. I think that's the greatest part about tricking is that it's always about taking it to the next level or always oh, about forward progression. It's a progressive lifestyle. Okay, so my name is Elizabeth Bryan and I'm originally from England in a place called Bristol, the southwest of England, where Wallace and Gromit come from. When I was 19, I uh, decided to move to Australia and that's where I met my husband. We moved to New York for a bit and we had another kid in New York. All that, we've got four kids. We moved to Mexico and then from there we went down to Nicaragua. Pretty much all my life I've wanted to do something right, I wanted to do something good, so I wanted to do uh, missionary work. We moved to Mexico first as a stepping stone um, into Latin America and kind of prayed and just said, God, shut the door if that's not where you want us to go. And that's what he did. He shut the door and only Nicaragua would accept us. So <laughs> I just knew Nicaragua was my home. It just captured my heart straight away. We moved to Nicaragua as teachers because we wanted to do something good and like we wanted to help the poor people, right? Give them something to live for. But as we started to teach, we we've realized that all our time was being used up to teach. And so we didn't really have a lot of energy or time to give to what we really wanted to do. And we just felt that we needed to stop teaching full time and we needed to do something uh, that would help these people full time. So we come from a church in Australia, it's an AG church, it's called Capital Edge Community Church and it's in Canberra. And so we talked to them about maybe supporting us doing that and they were fully behind us because they fully believe in missions and they fully believe in helping people uh, in the best way that they can. And we quit our jobs and we decided to open up our home and we made a community center out of our home. So we opened up the doors on a Friday night and we uh, went around on horseback, inviting everyone that we saw in the community to come. Now that night we had over 500 kids come to the center. So it was crazy. And through that, we've become really good friends with the community and have been able to help a lot. When we were in Mexico, my kids went to gymnastics and there was an awesome gym there that they could use. And so when we went to Nicaragua, we wanted to find a gymnastics place for my kids. And there was nowhere, nowhere that offered gymnastics. There was a little place, which is the National Institute of Sports of Nicaragua. And we went there and it just had like one crash mat and like a couple of those thin mats, but nothing to the level that they wanted. Um, so that was kind of disappointing. Well, anyway, uh, later on, we decided decided to open up the home and make the community school for the poor kids and we teach English and, and the Spanish and uh, my husband had been watching on YouTube uh, this kid in Nicaragua do some gymnastics and that's how we learn about tricking because he called it tricking and we could tell he was kind of poor because of the background and he would uh, you know was in the dirt like doing this uh, doing these flips and my husband said um, I want to find this kid and I'm gonna offer him a job and he's gonna help teach these little kids and we're gonna uh, use that as an opportunity to help him in, in return so that's kind of how we learned about tricking and we had a coffee after and as we were drinking coffee in the corner of our eye we see these kids uh, these two guys and they're just like flipping and uh, my husband says hey go and offer them a job and I'm like you go offer them a job so we went and spoke to them and it turned out to be the kid that we'd been watching on YouTube and uh, that night they came and lived with us and that night they started 
Uh, being the teachers of tricking for the kids in the community. We could tell they were street kids, and you know, I've got two teenage daughters, right? Beautiful teenage daughters, and no mother in their right mind would let guys come live with them, right? Because we'd been following this kid for, I would say, four months, and we'd been trying to get hold of him, but we, there was no way to get hold of him. Um, and then it turned out to be him. It just it just felt really right to do. And so that night we invited him and his friend to come live with us. And uh, ever since then, uh, it kind of grew. And now we've got eight of the guys living with us and they teach tricking and b-boy and by chatta. It's cool. And that's, that's a hard thing to do, right? Is to give someone trust. Um, but yet when you give that trust, I don't know, it, People rise to that too. You know, some people take advantage of it, but most of the time people rise to that. And uh, that's one thing that we see when we work with the kids, like the street kids. Most people don't trust them. The last thing they do is open up their home to them. To, to open up and give them our trust, it really changes them as people. The guys that uh, live with us, I mean, they have heartbreaking stories. They're stories you just wouldn't even believe are true. Uh, they've been orphaned, they've been prostituted by their own fathers, they've been sold, they've been involved in child trafficking, um, they've been involved in child trafficking where they want to take your organs to sell in the United States. Um, they have had horrific stories. They all have had to work before they were 10 full time so that they could support their families. And it was hard work, hard labor, labor that kids should not be involved in, right? So their stories are heartbreaking. And they, out of everyone that I've met, have every reason to hate, every reason to feel bitter, every reason to feel ripped off. And what I love the most is that instead of putting the energy into negative things they found tricking and tricking really became their life and it became their outlet and uh, it really helped them deal with a lot of things that life threw at them so um, I mean one one kid he had to um, his job was to kill live cows at the age of 10 and it was his job to kill the cow and cut the head off and you know, stuff like that like does things to you mentally. They formed, you know, a tricking community uh, just by by helping each other and going to a cyber cafe and uh, looking at YouTube videos. What you you guys have been putting on loop kicks and Veyu and the big trick, you know, and and they really use those videos to encourage themselves and each other. And they would uh, go out and uh, trick and they found that the ground was too hard so they talked to a local carpenter and they asked him to give them sawdust for free. If they worked a little bit then they could get the sawdust. So the carpenter agreed and they used that as their um, as their like crash mat I guess you'd say. A lot of people in their community were very negative about that and they would make fun of them and they would say like look at you doing your little fancy tricks like that's gonna really get you a lot of money isn't it like it's gonna get you out of this hell hole and uh, and people would spit on them and just tell them they were nothing and no good um, but yet they stuck together and thanks to people on YouTube like the trickers on YouTube and the Facebook messages that people like Brandon and Veyu and Michael Goodtrick and, and Phil Gibbs like what they would say it just uh, continued to spur them on and be positive and, and encourage each other even though other people were being really negative. We caught them at that stage where they had kind of formed together They've continued not just to encourage each other, but now to impart that onto other kids that before had no like hope and no life. And you know, really, the only things they can turn to are like drugs and sex and alcohol. And uh, in Nicaragua, it's very common for girls at the age of 12 or 13 to get pregnant. Um, and so, what is great about the tricking, and what is great about these guys that live with us uh, now, teaching the other kids, is like it's encouraging others to like do something positive with their life, and and not get involved in like stuff that's going to just bring them down and get more depressed, but do something that's you know encouraging and and fun and positive. <laughs> We got uh, Johnny, who is awesome. He's a really good breakdancer, and Eric, uh, and they're b-boys. 
and they they joined us um, about eight months ago now. As they joined the team, like they started to see the trickers, and they were like, "I want to learn how to trick too." And the trickers have seen their b-boying, and they're like, "I want to learn how to b-boy." The tricking world and uh, the b-boy community are kind of similar, where they're really positive and they just want to encourage each other to get more into the sports and uh, make the most of their lives. So it's been neat to see them all like gel and like teach teach each other and. The combo of like the b-boy and the tricking is awesome. That's why we let them live with us. We want them to see who we are as people and we want them to then model positive behaviors to other people. What we were finding in Nicaragua is because they only know the Nicaraguan culture, they didn't really know other cultures, there were a lot of barriers. You know, what we were saying, uh, some of the things that would help them in their lives uh, were not really computing. So we felt like it was important for them to come out of Nicaragua so they could see that there was a different world, different cultures and experience life, you know. They've seen it on YouTube and, and they know that people are out there, but just to kind of like experience it for themselves. So one of the reasons why we're in California right now is to raise awareness of, of what's going on in Nicaragua. They're able to show people who Nicaraguans are, you know. A lot of people, when they think about Nicaragua, they know it as like poor and poverty and you know, uh, they think of like people, you know, with these pity eyes of sadness and despair. And we want to change that. We don't want these people to be pitied. They're just like anyone else. They've got passions and desires and dreams. It's just that they're poor. They're there because they've got talent and they've got worth. I mean, they teach other people this incredible skill. They get to come to America and give a positive message too. Because in America, like this is the land of plenty. And yet when we come to America, we see kids and they are depressed, they are bored, you know, they have uh, issues like self-esteem issues. And yet they have so much available to them. And yet they let their obstacles get them down. And these are kids that like have everything available to them. And yet uh, the guys from Nicaragua, I mean, everything was against them. And so because they, because of their positive spirit, uh, they just rose above that. And so what I think is really neat, instead of coming to California and saying, pity me, you know, I'm poor, uh, they've been able to turn the message around and say to kids in America, like, what are you doing with your life? You know, like we've had problems, everyone has problems, but you can overcome that. And there's things that are available to you if you choose to grab hold of that, you know? So I love that, I love that. Man, they love tricking. Tricking is everything to them. And they've had a lot of obstacles. It's been their outlet. It's been something that has made them say, I can do this, you know, I can live life. Some of the boys will say, because of tricking, they live today. You know what I mean? Some of it's been too much to handle, but tricking, uh, the positive environment that tricking brings, um, it's just encouraged them to keep going. Thanks to, thanks to the tricking world, you know, these kids, these, these teenagers are, are here today. The internet is the greatest tool for freedom in our world and you can you can attribute that to anything you want like tricking is an expression of freedom but maybe we wanted to rebel a little bruce lee was a rebel right his whole style was birthed out of being a rebel and that's kind of what tricking is i feel like for a lot of the martial artists is that we kind of want to break out of the form the format and we want to you know be free in the air for only like a couple seconds just to see what would happen right the internet is allowing that to happen in every area of society of culture right like for me now i see it in the the, the health and nutrition field where we we've been dominated by kind of health insurance but really what that was was we gave away our power to somebody else and let them dictate to us what we should be eating or what we should be buying or how we should be you know, raising our family or whatever. But now we get into health assurance where we take responsibility based on the ability to go on the internet and see other people giving their testimonials, giving their accounts and sharing free information. There's this amazing crossover and because of the crossover, these worlds to converge. They come infected with tricks. Say the last time I was like doing school or something, 
I'd be in the middle of a problem, and I'd just like, oh, dude, this combo sounds awesome. I need to get back to work. <laughs> like, it's like always in your brain, new combos, new things. It gets absolutely endless no matter what you do. Even if you have like a trick library of like four tricks, you can turn those four tricks into like 250 combos. You know, like it just, the possibilities are endless with tricking. It's just always going up and up and up. New things are created all the time. It teaches you never to give up on something, you know? And I think um, a lot of kids nowadays, they're so addicted to like this, these TV shows and they live like this fantasy. But when it actually comes down to actually getting out there and they come in contact with a, like a wall or something, they don't know how to get over it because all they know is watching TV or they, don't, they never ever really worked for anything. So I think if they put trick in or as a like school activity, yeah, that'd be amazing. It would, it would definitely change the world, that's for sure. The positive communal nature of tricking is entirely based around the concept of recognizing the expression of humanity within all of those around us. Right, it's easy for us to be arrogant and think, I can do this move, and it's only because I'm special that I can do it. But then when you express it and you realize, like, man, that was tough, and I tried, and I had to push, and I really dug deep, and then you look over and somebody else does that, or something similar, something equivalent, and you see them dig out and pull that same spirit out of them, you realize that you're not dealing with the other anymore. You're just dealing with yourself and your own crew. Uh, and that expression, I mean, that love comes through with just our excitement. When somebody else does a trick, we know that feeling because we've been there. We've done maybe even that trick and we are forced to acknowledge that glorious humanity in them when they do that. More than can it, I guess I'm just gonna get busy trying to make it change the world and I'll let you know in like a decade how it goes.